Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome everybody to the SIG webinar, case studies of three exits for African social enterprises. I am Sayuri Sharper, president of MIT Social Entrepreneurship Alumni Group. Your moderator today is Yona Lipishti, who manages the MIT D-Lab Scale-Ups Fellowship Program. She will be joined by three alum of the D-Lab Scale-Ups Fellows who have successfully exited from their African social enterprises. They will tell us about their stories of building and selling their impact foes companies. So a few logistics. Each of the speaker will take about 10 minutes for their presentation. You can use a Q&A button to type in your questions during the presentation. We will have about 20 minutes at the end to go through these questions. So let me start with a few words about our group. We are organized under MIT Alumni Association. Our mission is to bring together MIT alum and like-minded like people to co-create a better world through social entrepreneurship and impact investing. I'm often asked, what is our definition of social entrepreneurship and impact investing? So here they are. The key phrase for social entrepreneurship is through a market-driven approach. By adopting a market-driven approach, social enterprises naturally scale their impact as they grow their businesses. The key term for impact investing are intent, contribution, and measurement. The impact, the, excuse me, the investment must be made intentionally to contribute or add to the overall impact that is measurable or quantifiable. These are features of an investor and not that of the enterprises. For each investment, an investor needs to be deliberate, clear rationale for making the investment and continuing monitoring of the impact generated. So how do you stay engaged with us? You can join our community platform. Membership is open to anyone who is supportive of our mission and would like to be a part of a vibrant community to make this world a better place. So lastly, an announcement for our next webinar. I'm delighted that Roseanne Whaley CEO of AHO Venture Partners can join, join us from Nairobi, Kenya at 8 p.m. her time for an intimate discussion about the current landscape for venture investment in Africa. Whether you are a social entrepreneur or an investor, if you're interested in Africa, this is a must attend event. Registration information is available on the C community platform or on our website. Now, let me turn it over to Yona. Hello. Okay, so hi everyone. Just give me one second while I also share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yona, do you wanna try again? I will. No. How are we doing now? You're on. Great. Okay, well, hello, uh, everyone. I am excited uh, to moderate uh, this session. My name is Yona Rapishti, and I run a small accelerator that's called the Scale Ups Fellowship uh, at MIT D Lab. I support local founders that are building and growing inclusive businesses in emerging markets. Every single year, we select a small cohort of uh, six entrepreneurs and then use our trademark methods of co-creation and participatory design 
um, and also leverage the global networks uh, that DLab has built uh, around the world um, to work with the entrepreneurs around particular challenges that they're facing to grow their businesses. Today, we're gonna dig into one of these challenges, exits in African markets. Um, thank you Sayuri and the alumni group for uh, giving us this opportunity to, to, to speak on this subject. Um, this I feel like is a special treat for me because I get to spend the next hour with three of the Scale Ups alums, uh, Jody, Sebastian and Kevin, and, and they will introduce themselves uh, shortly. But um, we will hear from them around their firsthand experiences around building products and businesses and then successfully pursuing exits. This is a topic that has been on my mind for a while. First, there's not that much information around um, exits in Africa. There's a sense that the market is maturing, uh, but and, and there's a sense that the trend is moving in the right direction, but there's not that many stories that are unpacking what's happening uh, around these exits. Um, Next, I think exits are just interesting because this is supposedly the time when the entrepreneurs, the team and the investors um, are getting paid. It's also a way to really scale your impact if you think about impact. But um, oddly enough, when you talk about emerging markets in Africa in particular, a lot of the narrative is around how to build the startup and how to grow it and raising money, but not a lot about the end game. And that's what we want to explore today on this um, call. And we'll particularly look at one exit modality, um, and that is acquisitions. So let's uh, together start unpacking the black box. Um, out of a portfolio of 39 enterprises that the Scale-Ups program has supported to date, uh, we have three that have pursued exits. And I invited all three of them here today um, to speak to us. And I asked them to look in the rear view mirror and share their journey with us. Um, they will each speak about 10 minutes and tell us uh, the businesses they built, the story of the exit, and also the lessons that they learned along the way. But before we get started, I really want to get a sense of who's in the room so we can also tailor the content um, to, to the audience. So Lizzie, if you can help me, we have a, a little poll that's prepared. Um, Wait a couple more seconds. So about 80% of the people that have voted. And interesting, uh, we've definitely got about 30% of the people in the audience are from startups, um, some universities, uh, few investors, um, and also a group of others that hopefully we can find out a little bit more about. Great. Thank you so much. So let's share the results. Great. So without further ado, I really want to pass on um, the mic uh, to our three incredible um, speakers. Uh, but I also want to share a couple of things before they get started. Um, first, you know, there's a chat function. Uh, please use it to introduce yourself if you join the session. It's always great to know who's there. We want to know who's in the room. And we also want this to be an engaging session. So we're going to spend about the first half um, around hearing the stories and then the latter half around Q&A. So uh, we will not uh, take the Q&A until the end of the session. Um, so if something comes up, please put it in the uh, Q&A box and, and I will be collecting and, and sharing out those questions at the end. Um, so um, let me pass on um, uh, the mic to Kevin Cedrone, um, and we will hear a little bit about him, his background, and also um, his, his startup and his acquisition story. Um, Kevin. Hello. So my uh, story started at a hackathon, and uh, I was a technology contributor to someone else who came with the problem with the pitch. And his pitch started that uh, millions of babies every year are born and need help taking their first breath and that even very well-trained uh, doctors in Western hospitals aren't very effective at giving them emergency ventilation. 
And as a result, birth asphyxia ranks uh, in the top three causes of uh, preventable newborn death, something like 1.8 million deaths a year just from birth asphyxia. Uh, next slide. So this is actually a picture of the, the doctor, um, Dr. Uh, Santorino Data at that, at that hackathon in 2012. And uh, his request was, could someone in the crowd build me a data logger so that we can figure out what's going wrong? All he wanted was a tool to understand the nature of the problem. Um, and uh, so I was a grad student at the time and it was adjacent to my uh, area of research. Uh, next slide. So I built him a prototype that weekend with uh, another electrical engineer. Uh, you can see this sort of ugly but effective uh, thing we, we put into the flow path. Oops, uh, previous. Yeah, this ugly but effective thing we kind of introduced into the flow path uh, to monitor what was going on. And uh, over the course of the weekend decided instead of just figuring out what was wrong as a literal post-mortem, uh, that maybe we could use this to, to determine in the, in the moment what was going wrong and give people, give people feedback. So uh, with the help of some support from uh, DLab Scaleups, um, actually the, the, I think two months later we were in Uganda doing a technology feasibility trial just to see uh, if uh, in the field, it, it, under realistic conditions, we could get the data we wanted uh, you know, from a training context. And that's what you see in the bottom right corner is uh, uh, training with a rubber mannequin and seeing whether or not the data are, you know, give us clarity into what's going on. So next slide. Um, we built uh, successive revisions of prototypes, uh, building on feedback from users in, uh, in Boston area hospitals and uh, in, across Uganda and uh, a couple other uh, peer hospitals and, and some friendly hospitals that we had uh, some links with. And uh, it became a, a training product first, training because the uh, you know, regulation's easier and there's a sort of wedge effect. If you train someone really well from day one, uh, there's a possibility they might never actually need something like this uh, when, they're, when they're doing it with a real uh, baby. So we got it to the point where we had sort of sold hundreds of units and done some, some clinical trials to validate that the feedback is helpful, that it does make meaningful uh, changes to uh, people's behavior in, in a positive way. And we were, uh, we were planning a trial to do uh, mortality analysis and, and really tie it to the endpoint that we all care about, which is uh, saving newborn lives. And at that point, one of our funding agents sees, uh, so on the next slide, uh, we had, we've been extremely lucky to have uh, support from a consortium called Saving Lives at Birth, uh, as well as the D-Lab, MIT Ideas Global Challenge and some some hospitals and some, you know, some friends and stuff like that. Um, one of our funding agencies came to us and said, you know, we're we're tied up with Philips on another project. They're interested. It seems to fit in their portfolio, um, respiratory care and and, and stuff. So uh, while we were planning a trial to to look at mortality, um, we get uh, tied up with Philips. And uh, because of the status of the intellectual property, uh, Mass General Hospital was negotiating with Philips on our behalf. It's actually a licensing deal. So. Not a, not a straight acquisition or not a traditional complete acquisition of a company as such, but uh, of the core IP. And uh, so next slide, uh, you know, basically we met up with the Philips team, in this case, the innovation campus in uh, Bangalore, India, um, and uh, sort of started doing tech transfer. And, uh, you know, there were a couple of Frankenstein prototypes of our stuff and their stuff, gradually transitioning to all their stuff. And there are some, you know, some renders and some actual physical prototypes, you know, shown on the slide here. And uh, yeah, so the, a lot of the negotiations were a kind of very fun in, in healthcare, this sort of three party arrangement is not uncommon. There's us, there's Philips, and then there was the hospital and we all sort of want the same thing. And we all sort of, you know, have the same incentives but uh, there were definitely some places where, uh, you know, cooperation and alignment could use improvement. Um, and then I have a slide on key takeaways for the, the whole process overall. Um, this started as a hackathon side project. And then the only reason it got to um, an exit is that there was a full-time champion. So it was not always the same person. I literally quit my job to work on this full-time for a couple of years. Uh, and then the medical people on the team, I, I mean, it was never their full-time concern, but at various points for various months, someone was giving this their full-time effort. And I can't stress that enough that uh, if it's just a side project, it'll, I have a hard time believing it'll get the momentum it needs to really, you know, reach escape velocity. Um, feedback works, and so our, you know, our whole product was about giving people uh, high quality, objective information about how they're doing as quickly as possible, so that if they're doing something wrong, they can fix it, and if they're doing something right, they can continue. 
And uh, so that works. Our study shows it, our product shows it, whatever. But also, and this is uncomfortable sometimes, feedbacks, feedback helps you make your product or service better. And it can be uncomfortable to, to put your thing to the test, to um, really put it out there and see if people adopt it and, and run with it or sort of reject it or request changes. But things get better from, from feedback. And uh, yeah, there are a lot. It's funny to, to look back now and some of our early designs um, and think about things we thought were a good idea. Uh, and then they just fell flat on their face or one of the actual users came along and made a suggestion that was way better than anything we kind of had on the drawing board. So this is a design and engineering thing. You got to test your assumptions, iterate and so on, but also business and market. And so, you know, we as a team had an idea about a hybrid um, or, or, you know, cross uh, subsidy model where we might sell it very cheaply in one uh, market and very expensive in another. And, and uh, you know, there was a lot of work sort of designing these business models and, and uh, these are things that needed to be tested. And so, you know, this is a place where Philips has actually had a lot of value. They've got a lot of experience with differentiated pricing and, and different value models and stuff like that. But every assumption until, you know, what someone says they'll pay doesn't count. It's what they pay. And, you know, if they say they'll pay and they don't pay, that also counts. And so, you know, testing those assumptions, getting feedback, and then having someone that's driving it full-time, I think, were the, the key takeaways for me uh, on this project. So. Um, yeah, that's that's the the error project from from hackathon to exit. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, before we move on, I, I just have one uh, short question, which is, where is air now? Uh, what what is happening? Is it in market? Uh, where can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, I, air right now is giving me a couple of emails a week of people who found our website and asking to buy it uh, as, a, as a training aid. In particular, some of the groups that do a lot of training, um, help, the Helping Babies Breathe program is, has a lot of sponsors that do you know, hundreds or thousands of uh, trainees per year and, and they, they are believers and they want these things. Um, right now, Philips is commercializing. They're going through their product realization uh, process. So converting, um, uh, converting things that can be made, made and distributed at scale. And they are set to ship, uh, I'm not sure if the number of units is public, but ship units for a very broad um, multi-continent trial uh, that was funded through some grant funding, uh, a, uh, a transition to scale uh, grant um, from Saving Lives of Birth to uh, estimate and record, uh, you know, like I said, that mortality endpoint data. Um, and uh, my understanding is that this was supposed to be um, sort of on the market, broadly available already, and that there were some internal business unit um, uh, challenges within Philips or, or changes, not challenges, changes within Philips of which business unit owned it. It's it's kind of funny that you know Philips is such a huge uh, global company. Uh, even just their healthcare division is so big. Uh, some of their divisions are bigger than you know, our whole company was even at, at, at its biggest. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's still still rolling there. They're, I get emails, uh, technical questions from some of their engineers from time to time. Um, but uh, I think they're on like the third version, third revision of their prototype, uh, prototype hardware, you know, on, on the journey towards production, I guess you really wanna make sure you get it right before you pull the trigger and start making these in, in, uh, in big quantities. So um, yeah, it's, it's not my full-time job anymore. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, no, that's, that's super uh, helpful to kind of put it into context of where things stand now. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, and we will move on um, to Jody next. Hi, Jody. Hi, Yona. <laughs> Fix my camera. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jody. I'm a 2009 uh, MIT alum, uh, one of the 100K business plan competition winners. Um, and that company at the time was Global Cycle Solutions and the company that I sold ended up going by the name simply GCS where our mission was about improving life. So um, yeah, so about what we did. Uh, so the mission of our company, you can go to the next slide, was simply to, to provide rural villagers access to transformative technologies through last mile distribution. Uh, my story began uh, initially developing technologies um, I actually what I had developed in DLab2, and then it uh, quickly transformed into, how do you want to turn this into a business? 
And I realized that I want to be delivering technology to people in need because technology without reach is technology without impact. You can go to the next slide, Yona. So um, when it comes to distribution, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of reasons why technology might not leave the university or might not um, reach the people you intended to serve. Um, one of that is infrastructure where roads might not be passable uh, or there might not even be a road <laughs> to where you need to go. Roads might not be passable when it's raining or during rainy season. And then there's a trust factor. So in Africa, a lot of the market is really, uh, it's all cheap, cheap, cheap products that have come into, come into the country that break as soon as you buy it. So our goal was to, how do we get, how do we bring amazing products, but also get people to trust it. And then there was service. So when you're in the village, things break and you don't have uh, super glue for, actually super glue is readily available, but you don't have like equipment to, to just go buy another one. Uh, usually it's just broken and you, you have to hack together or figure out how to fix it yourself or just be left with a broken product, which is most frequently the case. You try to hack it, it doesn't work. And then you're just with a broken product. And the last part was around the data. So what can we learn from our customers? How do we collect more voices to better understand what are the needs to reach the customers? So what we were doing was basically training a network of micro entrepreneurs who became like product experts who would educate customers about the benefits of the product and, and how they would gain from that. You can go to the next slide, Yona. So what we figured out was how do we take products? So in this case, uh, our biggest selling products, we eventually became the biggest distributors of Sun King Solar Lanterns and uh, Jikokoa um, charcoal stoves in Tanzania was how do you take this, identify these amazing products that have after sales service that have really been designed with the customer in mind and how do you get it to the customer? So we basically had set up a distribution chain where we ourselves were importing these products. Um, we were then sending them out to our branch offices and then we had um, field officers who were then taking these to our entrepreneurs who are then taking them to the customer. So it, it, you can see it's like big truck to like, okay, it goes on a bus. Now it's on a motorbike because there's not a bus there. And then now it's on a bicycle or by foot and now it gets to the customer. So in this whole chain, we were able to make a margin and start to um, gain a lot of traction in terms of bringing value as a company. Next slide, Yana. So, um, Fast forward, uh, putting this on the context, actually, um, I realized uh, today is actually like the four year anniversary of when uh, the people I sold the company to, uh, Greenlight Planet, had come to Tanzania and I had taken them across the Serengeti uh, to visit our customers in a super remote area. Definitely no power, um, <laughs> definitely no, even difficult to find a hotel. <laughs> All those, all those aspects. So this all happened. My exit was um, was four years ago. In terms of the story, it also it began at MIT. Uh, the name was Global Cycle Solutions. We were actually um, trying to transform the bicycle into a platform for for delivering and providing different agricultural services to smallholder farmers. Um, in 2011, I realized it's not just the technology; it's about the distribution. And so in 2017, uh, we actually um, became a green light planet company. And what happened after that was we expanded across the country. So maybe Yona, you can move one slide for, forward for just a moment. So I, when they acquired us, uh, GCS became green light planet Tanzania. Um, that was a separate long parallel process. But when we made the decision, uh, we pretty much operated on trust. So I, I had actually started I, I call the, the exit story uh, like a, a courtship um, where I, and my, my story of actually even trying to sell my company actually began because I was actually trying to raise money for my company. I was like, finally, we're showing great results. Now, how do I sell the company or not sell? The, how, do I, how do I now raise the investment? Because now I'm confident to be like, hey, investors should put a lot of money in this, the great business. But what happened was, um, Investors weren't too excited that I had like a 100% Tanzanian team, except for myself. By that time, I was fluent in Swahili, so they're just like, um, where, "Where's your, where's your foreign uh, executive management team?" So I was having a hard time raising money. Um, but what shocked me was 
instead, instead of raising money, it was actually getting offers to buy my company. Um, at that point, we had secured over half a million dollars in grants. Um, we were very well respected uh, locally. And then that's when the board was like, if you're getting offers, sell the company. And um, if you want to get a good offer, you got to get multiple offers. So, um, so I reached out to Greenlight Planet to be like, hey, I just got an offer for someone. Because uh, at that point, because we were getting so, we were the best distributors for Sunking Soil Lanterns and for cook stoves. Uh, everyone with other products wanted us to bring their product um, to the field because they knew we could go very far into, into the interior. So the first offer that I've gotten was like, we actually don't want you to sell any of the products you sell right now. Um, we actually want you to sell our products. And I was like, I don't even trust your product slash you, you don't even have an engineer on your team slash uh, I'm, I'm going to follow the board's instruction to find, uh, to talk to others. And Greenlight Planet just happened to be interested in, uh, and had plans to expand to Tanzania, but also were kind of excited by the prospect of us being available. Um, in terms of why I jumped on this opportunity, um, it was really because um, actually in the field, people knew us as Sun King. So people would call us and be like, are you Sun King? And we're like, Yes and no, uh, we, we are the distributors, the main distributors of Sun King, but uh, we, we're GCS. Um, so it was a really great alignment for, for my team because we are very proud to sell Sun King. And then to be actually become Sun King was like not having to change anything um, about what we do. So, um, so yeah, so it ended up working out really really perfectly in terms of the exit itself. Um, I wanted to give you like more details. So I said um, in the previous timeline you saw, okay, I sold in 2017. So in August, 2016 was when I'd gotten like the first offer. And then I started telling Greenlight Planet about um, the possibilities that I would no longer be their biggest distributor in Tanzania. Um, um, in October, the CEO and, and chief commercial officer came in January, they gave me a term sheet. In February, they started sending containers of goods for us to start distributing. And we started, by March, we launched our first shop. And in the next six months, we opened 26 shops across the country. All of this is before I even got a single dime from Greenlight Planet. Um, I think the reason this deal worked is because they trust, we trusted each other. Um, I actually knew the CEO of Greenlight Planet, actually met him <laughs> via MIT actually, um, 10 years before. And uh, they had, we just had like a ton of respect uh, for each other and we sort of, um, and, and I, I gave them pretty much a, a risk-free offer um, in the sense that, uh, yeah, if I don't hit my milestones by the end of 2017, um, you don't have to pay me. Uh, all of it. It was like basically percentage based on the milestone. So if I hit 50% of the milestone, they were only going to give me 50% of the acquiring price. And for me, I was 100% confident that we are going to hit 100% of the milestone. So we actually hit it in advance. Um, and so we didn't get the money because the other element was they had to close their next round of investment. So that next round of investment didn't come till December of 2017. So it took about a year and a half for actually everything to finalize, for uh, my shareholders become their shareholders, for debts to be cleared, for people to get um, get their monies. So uh, it, it was pretty risky on, on both sides, but I think it was just that we had known each other for such an incredibly long time. And because there was such amazing alignment in terms of uh, you know, Greenlight Planet, we, we were the experts in, in Tanzania. Everyone came to us um to yeah basically it was like all these big companies that were raising millions of millions of dollars they're like yes now we have money to go deep in, deeper into these areas and then they'd find that we'd already been there so so even though we weren't known in terms of having massive massive marketing budgets um that happened with the renewable energy i guess you can say influx of millions of dollars um people on the ground knew us and we were uh just famous in that way. So that more or less concludes my journey and my story. And um, yeah, in terms of where I am now. So uh, as part of the merger, some things that I wish I would have known. Um, so I 
I wish I would have done more due diligence on green on Greenlight Planet itself. Um, you know, I think when I expected a company that was so, I, I guess you could say I never appreciated the value that we had created within uh, within GCS, which was I had really set I was the leader and I had really set this um, this culture of collaboration, of feedback, of family almost. And I didn't, it didn't even hit me or it, the thought didn't even cross my mind that when this acquisition happened and then I would be promoted to become or shift to, keep, shift to Nairobi to become their VP of new products, that um, all of that would die. Um, it would be whatever new leader was hired by the HR person would, would dictate. And, and that also came with other dynamics because um, uh, in, in essence, the Tanzania office was reporting to the Kenyan office. And so that in itself also had a cultural dynamic of Kenyans and Tanzanians don't tend to play well together. <laughs> so um, so I wish I would have done uh, a bit more on, on, on that side in terms of really thinking about what was the most important elements of my company that I wanted to be retained into the next phase as Greenlight Planet Tanzania. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Jody. That was fantastic. For thank you for sharing the ups and downs and the surprises around the corner. Um, we we'll definitely hope to dig into some of those stories a little bit more in detail. Um, now I want to pass on uh, the microphone to Sebastian and hear right. a little bit yeah. uh, more about uh, Copa Gas. Hi, Sebastian. Great to have you here Hi. with us. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, very excited to be here and very nice to see the stories of my, my colleagues. Uh, I'm just going to talk about our company, it's called Copa Gas. Uh, we also started in Tanzania, so something interesting <laughs> is happening in Tanzania. Uh, we were uh, focusing on clean cooking and Jana, if you can just go to the next one. I mean, really, uh, personally, I did a PhD in engineering. I ended up uh, participating in the IDDS 2008 and really getting into these uh, low cost uh, solutions and designing for uh, the bottom of the pyramid. A really, really exciting uh, journey. And then uh, personal reasons, I met someone, we moved to West Africa. She worked for um, the International Development Agency and really I needed to find a job. Uh, I end up working on rural electrification, more on the side of investment and planning and just special. I didn't know anything about cooking, uh, even though I was supposedly an um, expert in energy. Uh, so basically every start, everything started with an email from a Tanzanian guy. I uh, just put here, it's very short email to say, well, we are an enterprise located in Tanzania. We want that you install your solar systems in rural areas, would you like to partner with us? And uh, so it was a very straightforward, very interesting. I mean, over the years, I was in the kind of um, consultant and, and luxurious life of, of just, you know, trying to implement projects in Africa. Uh, and I was really surprised by the, my, who is my co-founder now in Copagas, uh, his approach, he, he's a finance person, and really a very down to earth person. So we we try to do rural electrification, very hard, very a lot of investment. And he said, well, you know, like there's a lot of people in Dar es Salaam alone that are still cooking with charcoal. Uh, let's just focus on that. It seems to be easier of what we want to do uh, in rural areas. So yeah, we, we start investigating a huge problem, a 2.5, 2.6 billion people cooking with biomass fuels and kerosene, uh, which is very bad. What was very different for me and, and is not very well known is like a lot of people actually in, in urban locations uh, with high density. So Dar es Salaam is a prime example. It's still like 20% of the population in, in the city is using cooking gas. Uh, so 80% is still using charcoal. It's a very big expenditure every day. So everybody needs to cook. So the, the economics are very clear. It is very big problem, very interesting. So uh, I quit my job. I invested most of my salary and savings 
moved to Tanzania and we funded Copagas in 2015. Uh, and Jonah, can you one? So the idea was really how we make a pay as you go solution, uh, given that at the time pay as you go was starting to be a, for solar for lighting was starting to be very interesting proposition. So our concept was, can we build something that it can deliver gas little by little and we people can pay with them pesa more money and, and, and how to do it. So what's very interesting engineering challenge, you know, very basic concepts, uh, hardware, design hardware is very expensive and, and we didn't have any idea of, you know, standards that the gas industry needs to have. So, so yeah, we spent part of that first year just uh, understanding the requirements, understanding the, how we're gonna do it. And next one, Jenna, if you like. So, you know, we also needed to pay the bills. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was nice to, to have a, a new product, uh, but we also needed to have some, you know, uh, brick and mortar operation. And then that was basically a contribution of my co-founder, you know, like uh, he managed to get a dealership uh, agreement with the biggest company in Tanzania that sells the propane tanks, uh, propane gas. So we basically start selling gas, just like <laughs> we needed to understand the business, understand the sector, uh, you know, at some point really uh, workers wouldn't come, wouldn't show up. We needed to start the whole culture around, start, start a real uh, company, uh, but, but like really from a, it's like SME, just like, a, you know, there is this capital, we don't need to lose it. We, we just need to make a, a profitable operation. That actually resulted in a very interesting uh, lifeline for the business and for the investment in technology. Uh, we have a revenue growth quite quickly and um, fast in, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, so, there's some numbers there. So very quickly we have the turnover, the revenue that uh, it would be a reasonable company. And so there's something interesting to own and, and preserve for very long, uh, which give us a bit of more, uh, you know, running rate to reach uh, partners like uh, ESMA or uh, DIPIT and, 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 and different, and then develop the relationships with other supporters like uh, LPG companies. Uh, so that's maybe one one key thing is, is you, you know, you, I mean, startups need money. It's very difficult to forecast when you're gonna have those money. So so it's really nice to have some sort of uh, revenue. So that would be the first big thing I think so that happened to us. Then uh, the project really got steam. We have this more final uh, product that can be used in real customers. We got uh, some uh, awards during that launch. And then can, can you go to the next one? Uh, and really we had a lot of technical challenges, how to make it small, how to make it more affordable, uh, better performance and so on. Uh, and we did that basically on our own budget. Uh, and then we were able to face some investors uh, like Acumen and, and some, uh, for some reason, we got a very <laughs> eclectic kind of investor base. Acumen in the US, Saison, which is a Japanese uh, like 80 year old gas company, uh, VG, which is a German uh, financier, and HRSV, which is a Dutch uh, fund. So, you know, very interesting to see the vision from different angles, I mean, from the American angle, from European angle, Asian angle about Africa, they, they have different views of what are the opportunities in Africa. Uh, but that gave us the cash we needed to really complete uh, the product development and especially start proving not only that the people are happy to use the product, but there is a business behind it. So, so we also needed to develop um, technically uh, what is inside, where it's very difficult to measure the gas in small amounts. And that led us to China. We also got a, a 
we're fortunate to meet people there and, and we have an office, uh, we founded an office in 2018. So really trying to remove the middleman in, that makes expensive the, the product. Uh, yeah, next one. Uh, so yeah, from 2019 to 2020, uh, really the, it's fine to have a product, but then to make it into a real business, you, you need to have a system, you need to have people need to operate it. Uh, you need to know what is happening with your customers. So really a lot of the software tools uh, we needed to design and develop, not because we wanted, just because it didn't exist. Uh, so it, it looks similar to solar home systems, but in, in this case, we need to go to the customer every time the cylinder finishes. So we cannot have a very large distribution network, it needs to be very concentrated. And, and there were very interesting challenges like scheduling uh, cylinder changes or you know, repairs, things like that. So yeah, the next one, you know. So, well, that's, a, I, I was the CEO of Copagas, well, still Copagas exists. And, and then the story about the exit, uh, we got to a point where similar to the other uh, panelists today, we need to raise more money. We were looking around $10 million uh, of investment for the next round of growth. Uh, but also we were asking, and, and that was very interesting from company, uh, uh, patient capital like Acumen, uh, you know, the problem is very, is larger than Tanzania. So in Tanzania, like in the last few years have been seen not like a very investor friendly location. So we were struggling to, to find a, the right track. Uh, we met a group of investors that basically they wanted to do similar things in Kenya, uh, but we didn't have uh, much, you know, like uh, insights and, and having done it and having run a, a company uh, in the traditional way, we're also in the technological way. And so we start discussion basically with them trying to invest in the company. Uh, we, we started uh, around February, uh, 2019, uh, the whole process lasted a, a year. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of things about uh, uh, realizing our weakness as company that we needed to expand the team. Uh, basically, the company was becoming more of a, a financial, very heavily in finance. So we needed to bring like, uh, CFOs and, and, and even though my partner is in finance, but like international experience. And, and, and we wanted, and this infrastructure play basically the horizons of return that money is like seven years or something. So, so we, we saw this, the gap in our, uh, in our team, the other party also not had, didn't have enough experience in the operations of day-to-day -day company in Africa. So actually it was a very nice balance of, of um, a, skills and, and, and outcomes. So we come to a point that uh, one of the, uh, the other party, also uh, someone I respected over the process, we said, well, well let's, let's just do something together where we don't just uh, put together the companies. Uh, so for uh, legal reasons, it was easier that they acquire us than, rather than uh, they just being investors in the company. Uh, which uh, put something very interesting dynamics. Uh, we, we'd never planned that exit. And I think so many of the social companies don't plan for exits. This is a really a difficult question. Uh, but it's really the first time that your shareholders will have different views of what an exit means for individually, even for my co-founder and myself, not being from Africa, I'm from Mexico also meant like a, it's an interesting proposition how an exit mm -hmm. for him is a different kind of thing because it's Tanzania. So, so I think it's very non-intuitive. It's a very long process. So it's as hard as raising money <laughs> in the first round. Uh, so it's, 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 it's really like the, uh, it's, it's not just like one day you will, someone offers you something and then happens. You know, in Tanzania, for example, we needed to have also some permits from the government to be able to sell the company because the size of the, of the transaction. And, 
And then, uh, but what was very good about this is like, uh, for example, we return quite a bit of money to patient capital like Acumen. Uh, themselves, they have had very few exits, if, if you like. Uh, so really is very few examples of exits. And that's really what is, is missing uh, in, in general in, in Africa. Personally, uh, it's, it's a very hard uh, decision uh, because you need to let go. Uh, and, and also, um, uh, but at, at some point it's not like a science really, like, you know, valuations and things like that are, are really uh, difficult. It's really like a, was a check hand in, initially much like Judy, and, and then we did a process to go through the boards of directors of the two companies and, and then the legal due diligence and so many things that really were new to me. So uh, maybe I, I think I should stop right there and, and give time for questions. Uh, but I would say that it's not as the exits as you know Silicon Valley kind of stuff that we see in the news. Uh, yes, why? Because still Africa is seen as a very high risk place to do business. So, um, so these assumptions of the future is still, even if you do everything perfect as company, is still have a big weight on, on what is the outcomes. So, but, but it's very good. I my only kind of advice for the young uh, social entrepreneurs uh, is that uh, you need to think about what is exit. So during this process, I had a, my daughter, uh, we, we, we needed to do personal decisions as well. So it's, it's interesting to try to plan those scenarios. So I think so that's for me, it, hey, Janan, and then happy to respond to any question. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I apologize a little bit for the background noise. I also have a child at home today. Uh, <laughs> But um, thank you so much for all your stories and uh, for sharing kind of the different facets and, and really starting to open up the discussion around, you know, what are some of the challenges as, as a founder in pursuing and, and, and um, thinking about exits, but also more broadly. And, and I thank you, um, Sebastian, for starting to, to open up the conversation about you know, how exits in a place like Africa are different um, than others. And I am going through the questions. I am going to prioritize first the ones that focus on, on the theme of exits rather than the particulars of the um, enterprises. So um, there, there can be an opportunity to interact um, and, and follow up with uh, participants on the specifics of the companies later. But um, I, I really do want to start um, with a question that uh, a few people brought up, uh, Natasha um, and, and Susan as well. And it's a little bit about, you know, will African ventures, ones that are run by um, African founders, um, see more exits? Do you see any trend of this changing? And, and really, you know, in your experience, what do you think needs to change to really um, see see more exits in general, but also more investment and more support in in, in local businesses? Uh, we do have um, the three stories that we have here come from the Scale Ups Fellowship, and these are the three exits that we have. Obviously, there's a lot of others um, in the market and, and voices that, you know, are not here because it, it's focused around um, the D-Lab Scale Ups Fellowship. But I think that um, all three people and entrepreneurs on the panel, um, we'd love to get your opinion on, on the broader context um, in Africa. Feel free to uh, jump yeah. in uh, if you have thoughts. Yeah. I mean, maybe just a, a con quick contribution. Uh, yeah, it's, um, definitely it's, it seems so odd that we're talking about African startups. In, 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 I mean, at least I'm not <laughs> from Africa. It doesn't seem that they, I think uh, we do have, um, a, I mean, definitely I represent the company. I acted as CEO. But definitely a lot of the things couldn't have been possible without the, the my co-founder, who is a Tanzanian, who made us basically survive during uh, many years in a very short budget. So, so really definitely, you know, to run a company in the US or Europe uh, is just a 
you need to do it the same with with less money. <laughs> so so really, uh, so so from so that point of view, is is hard. From the other point of view, is like uh, you know people trust me to give me the chance at least to pitch them some business proposal just because you know because MIT because uh, what I did before uh, because I managed to save money before even starting this business so so definitely there is a big uh, is a, a large group of entrepreneur and business people in Africa that they don't have these uh, these uh, platforms really so but uh, so so yeah we, we are kind of if you like uh, have the benefit of the platform and, 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 and hopefully this is a good incentive to, to more people to join. Uh, so, so I just gonna, that's kind of one observation is really hard, even with the people that have well funds funded with the best training, with the best advisory, it still is very hard just because, uh, you know, uh, most of our investments, uh, this business wants to do, or at least what we do in cooking, we cannot expect people to spend five, more than five dollars a month. So, so basically, you need to build a, a company with a margin of one dollar per, per per customer per month. So, so it's really really hard. So, um, just as I to start the, <laughs> with the discussion, so definitely is a market business approach, and and I really believe in that. At the same time, uh, some things are really hard because it's just you know very remote, very rural, or 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 you need a lot of money. Yeah, um, that's great. I'll, I'll only take one answer because there's a lot of fantastic questions that are popping yeah. up um, on, on, on the screen. Um, I, I want to move on to a question that Harpreet asked. Um, so she says that she really appreciates hearing so candidly about the financial side. Um, she's interested in whether um, you paid yourself as founders salaries while running the company and whether um, something around price discovery, like um, uh, did you pay or were the exits financially viable for you? Many times we hear about exits where the investors did well, but the founders not so little. So do, any thoughts on, on that and uh, maybe Jody or, or Kevin, uh, you could start uh, if you have any thoughts on this one. Uh, yeah, we, we were grant funded, so there uh, there weren't investors as such. Um, grant funding is nice because it's non dilutive. Uh, I did. Everyone involved was paid uh, a salary, uh, but you can stretch a grant for longer if you pay yourself a lower hourly rate and you don't bill as many hours. Um, so there was certainly some of that going on. Um, and then the exit, it's a licensing deal. So there's sort of a royalty structure. Um, I probably would have made more money with my MIT degree uh, going and getting an MIT type job, but uh, I'm comfortable with the decision I made. It was the probably the best professional experience of my life. It took me to a bunch of different countries and like really taught me a lot about uh, um, design for the user and this sort of thing. So um, yeah, it probably wasn't the best financial, like the financially optimal decision uh, but you can make a lot of bad decisions just chasing dollars. So, um, yeah. I don't know, Yona, if you still want me to answer. Yeah, that. if you if have you just something quick to add. I mean, I think specifically to your question, paying yourself a salary, I think in our accounting books, I was paid a salary. In reality, I was not paid a salary. Um, and so when the exit was, it was about clearing the books. So clearing everyone who was owed money, which included me having a backlog of many years of no salary. So it, it worked out really well for me. It worked out for all of our people who had lent money. It worked out for those who had um, contributed convertible notes. They got back. I think everyone was just surprised that uh, they got their money back plus more and, um, and they could opt in to become shareholders in Greenlight Planet. So even now I'm a, I'm a shareholder in this over a hundred million dollar company <laughs> right now. I mean, tiny fraction, but um, you know, I think seeing how big the company keeps growing, it's uh, I think all you can say I'm I'm an investor in them, and we'll see how uh, how much money I make if they ever sell themselves. Great. Um, I'll okay. try to squeeze in 
two more questions in, in the six minutes that we have left. Um, Deborah um, asked, uh, it's great to see you here, Deborah, what uh, role did the board of directors play in the exit? Did they facilitate, hinder, or play a neutral role? Consent, um, any, any comments on, on the board of directors and their role? Uh, I mean, if, if I may, uh, we did have a very interesting role because uh, you would have thought that they would be supportive. Uh, that definitely, they're they protecting the company and protecting the entrepreneur. So, uh, it's, 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 uh, so it's good that they have different views and that's why I put in the slide that you will realize that it's the first time your shareholders want different things. I mean, they, before they want you to succeed, but now when there is an exit on the side, they want different, different means different things. So uh, for example, uh, Acumen really wanted to either have an exit to be to able to pump the money back into other similar activities, which is great. Uh, whilst other people in my board, they wanted just to keep us growing. I mean, keep doing the same and then just people tag along. So, so it was really interesting. Uh, I think so the healthiest part is that you need to play all those exits because really I didn't never do it. So we just came with a term sheet and, and then that was the first time that, you know, okay, well, this is not what we want. Uh, so uh, these questions you never ask really to, to your investors initially, <laughs> or you ask, but it's not really real, you know, like uh, uh, just the, the option of the money really changed the view uh, to the board of directors. Um, there's also a really interesting question uh, that Yost uh, from, from MIT post, um, he says, now that you have all exited, would you consider sitting on the other side of the table, meaning build a business by acquiring and integrating others? <laughs> I thought that would be an interesting yes. Uh, yes. one yeah. to, to uh, throw at, at the speakers and, and use to wrap up our uh, session. I mean, definitely yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's at least uh, there is some. You could accelerate helping others to get somewhere, and I think so. That's also the role of uh, some VCs and people interested. They never really run a business in Africa, and that's reality. So they still have you no know, uh, unex unexpected uh, expectations that everything will go all right, and it's not really true. <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, but get those, those funds. So at the end of the day, you the, the best satisfaction, at least personally, was to return the money to our, the people that trust us. And I think so that's kind of good to, to you know, replicate many, many times. Yeah. Uh, from my side, I mean, I've already started investing in other companies, but I'm working for another company that's where I'm not the majority shareholder. So I think it's a, bit more complicated for acquiring and integrating others, but um, maybe the companies I've already invested in, whether it's own time or own money, uh, will we'll have some interesting synergies among them later. Yeah, I think if incentives are aligned, so if someone is willing to sell for a low price, maybe they just wanna get out and it's a red flag, or maybe it means they're so committed to getting it across the finish line, they'll take whatever they can get or, or whatever. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of value in in stuff that is discovering and integrating stuff that already exists rather than trying to do everything yourself and inventing everything yourself from scratch. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, I would absolutely consider. And plus, sometimes acquiring a company is a way to get the people, right? Not the idea, not the IP, but like just to get the people hired. And uh, so uh, in that regard, uh, sometimes it's the easiest way to hire people. It's the cheapest way to hire people. So um, I would definitely definitely consider acquisitions. Yeah. Great, no, thank you all so much. We have about a minute left and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time that uh, particularly the panelists that um, gave us such interesting uh, food for thought um, today. Um, I think I, I want to pass it on Sayuri. There, there is a way for people that were part of this webinar to continue to engage on uh, the alumni platform. Could you just um, speak a minute uh, to that to wrap up? So if people are still interested in continuing to 
think around the idea of exits um, and uh, from the perspective of entrepreneurs, investors, we can keep the conversation going, but in a different uh, online virtual platform. Thank you, Yoda. Um, just uh, so everybody knows, uh, if you join the community uh, platform and just uh, put your questions there, I can forward it to Yona and she can help us answer uh, some of those questions. And I think um, some of the speakers are also already on the platform. So uh, find them and ask your questions if you want a, a, a private answer. And the other thing I wanted to say is that um, there were questions about what happens with African founders. It's an experience different and more difficult. And for the people that ask that question, I really would like you to um, join us on the webinar uh, with Roseanne, um, uh, the, one of the trends I'm seeing is that more and more funds are being run by Africans locally with a presence. I would say three, four years ago, most of the financing uh, came out of funds that's in Europe or in um, US, but it's changing. So, um, attend that and you can ask your questions again and see what's going on. Thank you for joining and um, see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.